Stein. In 1985, you two were rising stars. They hadn't yet cracked the international stage, but that didn't stop them from being difficult. Only the night before, they threatened to pull out. Would they come good on the day? distance between stage and crowd. I don't like the distance between performer and audience. So I'm looking for a symbol of the day, something that, yeah, that I can hold on to. And I saw her down there getting crushed. I said, that, that's it. I've been good at distances. I don't think he realised that when she climbed down, that there was like a two-mile walk to get <laughs> the punters. And I didn't know when I was holding on to her, I would be holding on to the rest of the world, really, because everyone wanted to be. Everyone was shaken. Is the truth? People were disturbed. They knew that this kind of wall that they had built up, that we had built up between the us and them was coming down. Bonner was lost in his own world, but the rest of the band couldn't see where he'd got to and were beginning to panic. How long can we do this for? It was like, this is on and on. It, it, was, it was kind of excruciating. And we didn't know whether we should stop. We didn't know where he was. We didn't know if he'd fallen. And um, we sort of, and you know, just just as we're about to like stop, and um, just just climbs back up onto the uh, onto the stage. We were kind of annoyed afterwards because we felt like you know we'd blown an opportunity to you know to be great. It was it was it was our stage, and um, so we felt a little angry about that. I always felt, oh shit, it's all going wrong, when in actual fact it wasn't, it was actually all going right. They seem to have a grandeur about them. I think Live Aid was the point at which uh, U2 became a big stadium band. It really was the making of U2 as an international act. She can feel the satellite coming down. Pretty soon she was in London town. Crap sound, crap haircuts, and we and didn't end up playing the, the hit Pride in the Name of Love because the singer fucked off into the crowd. Band wanted to fire me as a result. And it turned out to be one of the best days of our life. Explain that. Ask God. He probably knows. Thank you. God bless you. Bono wowed the crowd. But he didn't have quite the same effect on two female coppers working backstage. A photographer came up and... Uh... He asked us, would we mind having our photo taken with this chat? And um, we entered into the spirit of the thing, didn't we, Ira? <laughs> we did. And said, yes, we don't mind. And uh, so he stood in between Iris and I, and he had a can of beer in his hand, and he gave us a kiss, and the photo was taken. And when I come around, I said, well, who was that? And uh, he said, that's Bono. And I said, Bono who? And he said, you too. <laughs> and I said, you too what? 
We hadn't got a clue who he was. Than anyone else, Stadium Supergroup Dire Straits kept their eye anxiously on the clock throughout their set. The megastars were in the middle of their sellout tour at Wembley Arena, down the road, and they had to get back there for their own gig an hour later. And of course, we had to go back almost immediately to do our regular performance to the 12,000 Dire Straits fans who would much rather have actually been at the Live Aid gig, but they'd already bought their tickets, so they were stuck. Getting away from the Wembley crowds wasn't as easy as getting in, but once again, two ladies in blue came to the rescue. When the chap came up, we were backstage, and he said to me, we're in Dire Straits, we need to get our stuff out quick. And I said, no problem. And we found the Wembley security, and I said, these blokes are in Dire Straits, and they need to get out quick, they've got to be down at a venue and he couldn't stop laughing. And he said, but they are dire straits, that's their name. <laughs> the world was watching, but the money wasn't flooding in, and Geldof was beginning to panic. I didn't dare ask were we making any money? That's the truth, I was afraid to ask. And eventually I had to. And they said, yeah, it's going great. And I said, you know, like how much? And it was pathetic, I think one and a half million. And it was truly pathetic and I freaked out. Bob was just fed up with the fact that uh, we were not putting enough appeals into the programme and didn't appear to be remembering. Uh, the purpose of the programme. Geldof headed for the BBC box up in the gantries, just as Queen were getting ready to go on stage. I see a little silhouette of a man. Scaramouche, Scaramouche, will you do the bandango? Thunderbolt and lightning, very, very frightening me. Galileo, 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 Galileo Figaro. Oh, oh, oh. I'm just the flamboyant rockers had been massive in the 70s, but many now thought they were past it. Before Live Aid, we were, we were bored, I think. We were, we were quite, we'd, we'd had a, a long, fairly long career by then. Um, and I think we were in a bit of a trough. Queen had played at Sun City in South Africa during the um, apartheid era. I think that anybody that has played there, I don't want to... Actually, I won't mention names. Rod Stewart and Queen and people like that have played there. The jerks were doing it, and uh, they, are, they were more than aware of what they were doing, and I think that they should be uh, called out for it. And for them, subsequently to appear at Live Aid as, uh, as the benefactors of Africa, struck some people as being hypocritical. It's interesting that they, they were the most nervous backstage. They were the most... They'd been arguing, they'd fallen out. They thought Queen didn't matter anymore. Anyway, uh, it gives us enormous pleasure to introduce the next combo, who are... Uh... Her Majesty, Queen! I do remember, I think we were quite tense, quite tense before we went on. Just hoping it was all going to work, you know, that the equipment wouldn't break down. So would Freddie and the boys pull it off? Queen stole the show. Queen were 
live aid. The Queen was, was one of the seminal moments in the history of the 20th century. Forget Hitler, forget the invention of the internet or whatever. The Queen's performance was absolutely A1. So it's Queen's Day, I think. Yeah. They just stole <clears> the show. Best thing there. Fantastic. Gob shows. his way to berate the BBC, Geldof stopped in his tracks. And I was walking along the top, and I looked out, and they started, and I saw the Radio Gaga. <laughs> Just thought, this is extraordinary. Radio Gaga, Radio Gaga, all we hear is Radio Gaga. This was pop history in the making. Radio Gaga. Every single person in that whole place was clapping along to Radio Gaga and singing along. I thought, oh, fantastic, I wish we had a song like that. Freddie's command of the crowd even stretched across the Atlantic. But looking out onto the audience, 90,000 Philadelphians, you know, on cue with a television screen. I just thought that was powerful, really powerful. And yeah, that brought us together. That was the one moment I thought, we don't have to be in London. We're here and we're part of it. Freddie Mercury was only just getting started. I can't tell you what it feels like to be on a stage like that, in that situation where you have no control. And, you know, there is an infinite space underneath your feet if you fall, you know. It would be appalling if you really screw up, you know. And Freddie just thinks, ah, oh, what the hell, you know, hey yeah. old. Freddie would call, they would respond. And they loved it. They wanted to do it. A, fa a fascinating kind of power. I do remember coming away from that concert thinking I must go and buy a Queen album immediately like the rest of the world. And I think Queen got a huge resurgence of interest. Just as Queen were finishing their set, Geldof stormed into the BBC box, still fuming about the failure to raise enough money. Well, I was wound up by how great this was, having seen these guys, being magnificent. And um, suddenly I'm there and it's cosy, you know, celeb. DJ poptastic stuff. I've been joined, as you can see, by Pamela Stevenson, Billy Connolly, Ian Asprey from the Kelton, once again, Bob Geldof. It's all a bit telethonish. And that wasn't what this is, you know. I mean, the, the thing calling a charity did and drove me nuts. For me, this was finely tuned politics. You know, you've got to get on the phone and take the money out of your pocket. Don't go to the pub tonight. Please stay in and give us the money. There are people dying now, so let's give me the money. And here's the numbers. We let's read go about... through the way. I no. think we're probably going to get the address just... first, aren't we? What the fuck? We've got satellites. We've got space shuttles or not. We've got Concorde. We've got, you know, what's it? Right. You know, it seemed to me of another time. This notion that you do telethons, you do charity concerts, you do smashy and nice, you do, you know, shut up. No, let's fuck the address, let's get the numbers, because <laughs> that's how we're going to get it. And I'm thinking, actually, what everybody, every embarrassed TV presenter is thinking in those circumstances, I do hope my mother's not watching this. I think we're going to have to have the address first, and the address which you can... He's you can in like a burning elephant. 